pulled out just a few days back because that's how everybody does it these days. You're going to run for something, you're going to give me a video. And he did. That is Richard Winfield, a professor at the University of Georgia and a U.S. Senate candidate, 905 Classics of the Day, sponsored by Dr. Paul Brown, MD, Richard Dean Winfield, joining us in studio this morning. Professor, thanks for your time this morning. Uh, thank you for having me. All right, uh, the process questions first. We'll get yes. to some issues and some of those issues yep. that I know you want to address, as you did in sure. your campaign launch there. Uh, but okay, we have been discussing this morning uh, the developments of this week in yep. this Senate race. And let's again go back and set the parameters here because we have concurrently two Senate elections in November. That rarely happens, but it's happening this year. David Perdue is your regularly scheduled candidate. He's your incumbent. But Republican, uh, he is up for re-election. There are three Democrats now who are seeking the party's nomination, one of whom presumably will oppose David Perdue in the fall. That's not what we're talking about here. We have the cir circumstance in which Johnny Isaacson, Republican Isaacson, the health reasons that compelled him to step down at the end of the year. The governor makes an appointment. The governor picks Atlanta businesswoman Kelly Leffler, Republican Kelly Leffler. She draws this week a primary, ch not a primary challenge, there I go using that word. She draws a challenge from Hall County Congress from Doug Collins. All right, there's the Republican side. There may be others. But there are Democrats in this race as well. Uh, we have just discussed Raphael Warnock entering the race yesterday. Uh, you have Ed Tarver, who says he will run, and in studio with us this morning, Richard Winfield. All of them uh, would be on the ballot in November, a special election, that so-called jungle election. Okay, we'll talk about the dynamics there, but I want to circle back because the last time we talked, you were campaigning for Congress, an unsuccessful campaign yes. for Congress, running on some of these same ideas, uh, and we'll discuss some of those ideas in a moment here, but uh, just a, a process question first. If, if you had difficulty in a congressional election, it was confined to a congressional district, why would you expect a different outcome in a campaign for Senate? You know, I, I, in a congressional district like our 10th district, uh, a Democratic candidate faces huge obstacles, just as a Republican candidate will face huge obstacles in many of the metro area um, Atlanta districts uh, because of the way the districts have been drawn. Uh, Outside Atlanta, most of the districts have been drawn in a way where Republican-leaning voters <clears throat> have almost a two-thirds majority. That's not to say that it, it's impossible to change the minds of voters. As we have seen in, in Georgia sure. 6, sure. for example. So, but uh, you need resources. You need to have <clears throat> the ability to get out to the voters. And in, in the 10th district, outside metro area, there's really a kind of media desert. Mm. With some exceptions, such as this radio station and someone like you who gives candidates a chance to have a meaningful discussion, but by and large, there's very, very few opportunities to have any free media coverage that gets out to the voters and informs them of, of candidates. But you're thinking and the odds would be better, the playing field more level statewide. Yeah, well, statewide, there, there, there's two advantages. There's no gerrymandering. And we know from the last governor's election that the numbers of Republican and Democratic-leaning voters is becoming very even. So it's competitive mm. for people on both sides. So. A Republican and Democratic winner of what I think will be a runoff have a decent shot of uh, right. being able to. Okay. On the other hand, there's media coverage on a much greater scale. Sure. And yeah. also that means that people are not going to stand on the sidelines. They have to do something. They have to recognize this is a key election. The control of the Senate may rest upon this one election. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about where we're going as a nation. And we'll get to some of that, but again, I want to deal with the election first and just the, the mechanics yep. of the election. The conventional wisdom would hold that the Democrats would love to see Doug Collins and Senator Leffler slug it out for 15 rounds and, and stand there in the middle of the ring beaten and bloody and broke while one Democrat has a clear field and, and could possibly flip the seat without even the need for that runoff you're discussing there. That can only happen with the Democrats lining up behind one candidate. Right now, I can think of at least three. We've discussed Ed Tarver, the former state lawmaker, Raphael Warnock, sure. the, the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, and of course you as a professor of philosophy at the University of Georgia. Uh, the Democrats... I don't know, we'll see if you ascribe to the conventional wisdom yep. first of all, but wouldn't it be wouldn't the Democrats as a party be better served uh, following that strategy? Well, again, one has to ask ask the question: Is what counts first and foremost turning Georgia blue, as many Democrats aspire uh, to to have that transition, or does it matter what a Democratic candidate stands for? You know, I think we've seen that uh, Democrats have been in power both nationally and, and statewide, and they have not succeeded in solving the problems that have brought us to the situation we're at. 
So I think it's, it's crucial that voters get a chance to consider differing proposals as to where we go as a nation. All right, let's talk and, and, about... And Democrats are not all of one voice. Talk about what's driving your campaign. Yeah. You're one of the things... And I say what's driving your campaign. In your video, you lay out a five-point plan, yeah. and we'll get to those five points here. But I remember talking about this the last time you were in here running for Congress a couple of years ago. You're talking about it again now. Uh, guaranteed job. Yes. Everybody gets a job, and everybody gets the salary that comes with the job. How do we make that happen? I mean, the way you make it happen is by having the government do on a permanent basis what our government did during the Great Depression on a, on a lesser scale, which is when people can't find works, jobs in, in the private or public sector, um, the government will offer them employment, and the employment in question will be providing the goods and services that federal, state, and local governments feel are needed for the sake of their communities. And those can involve such things as fixing our, our rather decrepit infrastructure, providing things like mass transit, providing broadband for everyone, aiding all of our public institutions, schools, hospitals, public health care, bringing arts to, to all our communities, and basically making use of whatever skills uh, and interests people have. Uh, a couple and, of things that yeah. leap to mind here yeah. uh, by way of, of, of raising questions. Uh, the national unemployment rate right now, I don't know, what, 3% or change, 3.45%, yeah. yeah. whatever it is, uh, it's a similar level at the states. In the twos, I think, here in Athens, 2.45%, the unemployment rate here in Athens, uh, people have jobs. Well, Where are you going to find these workers? Well, generally speaking, most people do have jobs in this country. Um, even in the Great Depression, most people had jobs. But I think economists on the left and right are all agreed that the market is incapable of completely eliminating unemployment and completely eliminating unused capacity. <clears throat> you know, markets are not inherently efficient. They're institutions of freedom. We need them for that reason. But the freedoms in question are freedoms that not everyone can exercise. So even if you have 3% unemployment, nationally that means we have about 5 million people who want to work but can't find a full-time job. In addition to that, according to our own government statistics, you have nearly 5 million people who have part-time employment but want full-time employment. And then you have large numbers of people who have given up looking. The amount of participation in jobs of people of working age is at a historic low. It's about 60%. That means 40% of the people who could be working are not working. And that's a huge drain on both our general prosperity and I think it's something that contributes to all the kind of dilemmas of, uh, and ailments of despair that are racking our country. Another question that would be asked, uh, how do we pay for these workers? Yeah. We, we're the tra uh, national debt right now, somewhere in the neighborhood of 22, 23 trillion dollars. We ain't got the money. How are we going to pay for these jobs? Well, in a sense, I, I, th I think we, we do have the money. First of all, the cost of having such a program will largely be paid by itself. Uh, first of all, you have to recognize that we spend a trillion dollars on welfare programs. We spend well over 100, between 100 and 200 billion dollars on unemployment benefits. Uh, if everyone who is willing and able to work can have employment and have employment at a fair wage, then much of this welfare dependency is eliminated. In addition, when you put people to work under ordinary levels of, of, of productivity and responsibility, they're going to be producing goods and services that are of equal or greater value than what, what they're paid. So in that respect, it's a win-win. And in addition, we have to recognize that we have the largest economy in human history. We have the largest accumulation of, of private wealth in this country. It's now approaching $100 trillion. And we have barely tapped this. Uh, you know, there's been an extreme expansion and in income inequality that's been developing in the last 50 years. I think when, I think both of us are sort of in the boomer generation. I don't know how preserved you are, but yeah. I think we're, we're, we're comparable. The tail end of it. To be so, so I think, you know, when, when we were growing up, uh, levels of, of employment and, and income and union representation were such that a family could live reasonably decently with one wage earner and the wages of that wage earner, by and large, would keep pace with the growing prosperity of the nation. In about 1970, all of that stopped. Uh, wages have stagnated in real terms. Our economic growth has, is twice what it was before then. But nonetheless, we have been growing. We have twice as much, more than twice as much wealth produced um, per wage earner than before. But all of that extra wealth has not gone to wages, which are at their lowest share of national income. In our history. Yeah, no. They've gone to the top, and that is 
That is a problem both for democracy and for our national prosperity. Take a break here. Uh, Richard Winfield, Richard Winfield, University of Georgia professor, candidate, Democrat, running for U.S. Senate. Uh, back with more classics of the day, WGAU.